Proverbs chapter 13. And we're at a point in Proverbs where we look at the verses. And not every single verse, but looking at the verses and the, and the yay and the nay and the righteous and the wickedness. Looking at, a, looking at the Bible verse that we're doing, where do we stand? Yeah, we may be saved, going to heaven, glory to God. But how's our Christian walk stand? And there are people who, well, I'm Paul onlyism, and they miss the whole book of Proverbs. They miss the whole entire Bible. There's much more Bible than what Paul, and Paul's a wonderful, great Christian to the Gentiles, to the church. But we can also find Pauline doctrine in the book of Proverbs, chapter 13. A wise son, here is his father's instruction. But a scorner here is not rebuke. So, now when we think of scorner, and that's the first time scorner shows up. I'm a street preacher. I'm a public evangelist. And a scorner to me, oh, you know, take your Jesus and shut up. And we don't want to hear it. Keep it in the church. And But look at what Proverbs 13, 1. A wise son and the, the opposite scorner one of the jobs of a father is to rebuke his children and a child that not will not be rebuked by his father is not wise a wise son will, will take his father's instruction and even rebuke but the son that will not hear the rebuke of his father is likened into the family of scorners A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth. But the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence. So there's a man eating good. There's transgressors eating violence. There is good and there's violence. So no matter what the media and whoever would have violence to be good. Proverbs 13, 2, there is good. And on the other spectrum, there's violence. Far from each other. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that opens wide his lips shall have destruction. I remember when I got early into the ministry, I remember one of the things that was pastor, uh, you don't ever tell anybody to shut up. What's the verse telling us? Shut up. You know that there's two occupations that will get somebody in trouble. A preacher, because he's always talking. And somebody in the news, the media, they're always talking. He that keeps his mouth, he shuts up. He keeps, he keeps himself out of trouble. He doesn't get in trouble and he's spared life because he shuts up. Opposite. He that opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Jesus opened wide his lips and he ended up dying on the cross. Crucifixion. Uh, Peter and, and John open up their mouth and, and they're arrested, put in prison, and they're chastised for the word of God. Paul opens his mouth and he's chastised and he's stoned and he's beaten with rods and he's in prison. For what? Opening their mouth. Even in the name of the gospel and the word of God. But the Bible tells us to go in all the world and preach the gospel. 
And he that keepeth his mouth shut, as far as the, the church age, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Mark chapter 16, there's not life for you. Oh, people won't come after you. Be, you know, you will not have persecution. You will not have death. You'll not be burning upon the baggage. You'll not be arrested and all that. But when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and you got wood, hay, or stubble, and when somebody opens and preaches the gospel and preaches the truth, and Paul says to a church, to a Christian, have I become your enemy because I've told you the truth? And he gets that destruction from his mouth being open. But in the in the judgment seat of Christ, he gets gold, silver, and precious stones. The soul of the sluggard, the lazy man, desirous. He has needs, he has wants. And has nothing. You would think that'd be so. You think, hey, there's the scripture, it's true. Guy won't do nothing, gets nothing. Not in America. There are people who don't do nothing and they get they get grocery carts full of groceries. They get food, they get America, the, the biblical nation that we're supposed to be, God bless America, we violate the scriptures. It's called welfare, it's called public assistance where lazy people don't want to work for them. Now listen, I am not against public assistance welfare for people who work and can't make it. I am not against our vets, our military, people who have medical profound issues. I'm not against, but you don't want to ever, never have to do anything. And then the government gives you a check and gives you a reward, a card and go grocery shopping. That defies the scriptures because a man that did work for a living and got injured or ended up going to war or in the military get got injured or, you know, they are working, they can't make a living. That's not a slugger. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Now, what did it say? Did it say the flesh of the diligent or the soul? It didn't say flesh. If a man diligently does what the Bible tells him to do, what God's voice has told him to do, he will heap rewards before the law, during the law, the gospel period, the church age, the tribulation period, and the millennium. Noah had a fat soul. His wife and his children and his daughter-in-laws ended up in the ark. By him obeying God, everybody outside that ark died. A man that did the law to the T that rich young ruler had a fat soul, blessed by God. A Christian that has the fat soul of doing obedience to what we are told to do by the scripture, he's going to get a fat soul of gold, silver, and precious stone. And diligence requires time and effort and money of, of offering and reading and studying and prayer. And that will heap your soul rewards. The righteous man hateth lying. Now we all lie. We are never to say we're free of lies. That moment that, you know, that, that little extra extraordinary story that you told with a few extra details is a lie. We're going to have the celebration of Jesus' birthday on December 25th. That's a lie. Though the scriptures say that he wasn't born on December 25th. This is... It's a lie.
A lie is a lie no matter what color you paint it and the scriptures say the righteous man hated it. And the moment that you lie, you got caught, the boss caught you doing something and you brag your way out of it. And you tell a tale, a tall tale to get yourself out of trouble. You're to hate yourself. You're to repent of that. And you're to turn around and walk in that office and say, you know what? Boss, I know you know I'm a Christian, but I, I lied. I wanted to get my butt out of trouble. I've sinned. I've got it right before the Almighty God, and I need to get it right with you. I had a, I had a preacher tell me one good advice one time out of the pulpit. The best way to ruin the liar in you is the person that you lie to, turn your butt around, get to the person you lied to, and they're conscious, and tell that man, say, I just lied. No excuse. Hey, listen, whatever it was, I lied to you. Confess it before God and the person you lied to. That puts yourself down. That Your body be like, I better not do that again. You know what that guy's going to do if we lie again? Talking to yourself? That conscience? He's going to turn around and go to that person and say, hey, I lied. I don't like that. I had many times when I worked for the newspaper, and something would happen in, in the, on my workshop. I'd be, you know, scheming everything in my hand. And I get back to the, and I go in the boss's office, and knock on his door, and say, "Boss, I gotta tell you something." He says, "What?" Well, tonight this happened. Here it is. I did this. This happened. Whatever it was. And I remember many times I, my boss telling me, he said, you know, he says, listen, I believe you, Tyler. And it, it took something for you. Hey, yeah, you messed up. I won't say the word he used, but you messed up. But don't you worry, I'll start putting what I need to put to be. There's going to be maybe trouble out of this, but I'll try to help you. And there have been many times my own self, I have messed up and yeah, I got in trouble, I got written up. And there have been many times there's been trouble walking in the boss. Hey, listen, this is what happened. And if you tell the truth, your boss and the people that are involved can start taking care. And it, upon your character, <coughs> you know, your boss can go up to his boss and say, listen, all right, whatever the problem is, let's just put it down. That guy is responsible. That guy came to me and told me. He could have lied to us. He could have covered, but he came to me. Yes, he's, he knows he's going to get in trouble. But we can, we can do something. But a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. What is the opposite of the righteous, the wicked? The wicked man, the people who don't like a wicked man, except for these days, and cometh forth shame. Now, he may not get shame in the world. He'll get shame before God and Jesus Christ the Son. But we've been looking at the right, and we've been looking at the wrong. The right is the righteous man hated lying. What is the opposite of that? The wicked man, and he is loathsome, and he'll be shamed. You got away with that lie. No one ever found out. And you die, you're saved, you go to the judgment seat of Christ, and or you die, you go to the great white throne judgment. Here comes that lie. And nobody knew about it. Sometimes they call him skeleton in the closet. But to those people that you lie. You know, it's a great shame to parents when their children realize that there is no Santa Claus and there is no Easter Bunny. To a child of his parents that you have defrauded me, you deceived me. And that brings shame upon the parents. So 
You're going to, as a Christian, you're going to bring your children up in Santa Claus and Easter Bunny. And then you're going to tell them one day, well, there's no Santa Claus, there's no Easter Bunny. And then you're going to get the nerve to come up one of these days, you're going to tell your children about Jesus. And the shame will be, well, they didn't get saved. Why? You lied to them. You may be lying to them about Jesus. If you lie about a fat man coming down the chimney, you can maybe lie to me about a man who died on a cross. To your shame. You better not lie. Righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way. Righteousness, upright, and there's a way. But wickedness, opposite of righteousness, overthroweth the sinner. Now the righteous sin, but he repents and, and confesses and tries to get it right with God. That wicked man sins and continues to sin and sin and sin more and sin and sin and sin and sin. No confession, no getting right with God, no blood of Jesus Christ. At the great white throne judgment, he is at the sin by overwhelming. There's more in the books about his sin than his name being in that book. I hate to say it, but what if you got a wicked man in wickedness and overthrown by sin? And he's standing at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's got a pile of wood. And he's got a hunk of hay. And he's got much stubble. You stand back when that fire is lit. His wood and hay and stubble has overpowered him. Verse 7. There is, there is that making himself rich, yet has nothing. It don't make sense. There is that which make himself poor, yet has great riches. Run over to chapter 11, verse 24. There is that scattereth, gets it all out, and yet increases. There is that which withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. That don't make sense. Unless you do the analysis of God's bookkeeping and God's accounting. Go ahead, get rich in the world. Get your stocks, get your bonds, get your gold, get your money, get your gold bullion, get all the riches. Claim all the property on the Monopoly board. Fill all your space with all the hotels and all the houses and get the four railroads. And except for chance and community chat, everywhere somebody lands on that board, they're going to land on your one of your, your hotels. What's that do for you in eternal life? What's it do for you? You made yourself rich. Whether you're saved or you're lost, the, the, the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, what do you got? You take the common man's coffin, open up that lid, and what do you got? A body that's dressed and you didn't dress yourself. Well, look at the pharaohs and look at all the treasures they had. Uh, what's Pharaoh doing with it today? The Pharaoh is such a great God. Someone has stole his grave of all his stuff and he can't do nothing about it. It's so much junk. That, you know, they say that these museums have in the basement junk upon junk of the junk of the junk junk to be junk junk that they don't even can't even put out for the display. In the eyes of God, it don't do you no good. There is that which maketh poor, yet has great riches. Jesus Christ. <coughs> Jesus Christ 
And the Bible doesn't really say what kind of throne Jesus has in heaven. I can't say gold or pearl. Or, I mean, God's throne's got that emerald rainbow. Whatever spectacular, mag magnificent, ma majestic throne that Jesus Christ, I'm going to say had for a moment. When he got off that throne, And he was born in a manger in Bethlehem. He made himself poor, the Bible says, that I may become rich. His poordom, his leaving all the riches of heaven has got me a street of gold with 12 pearls that are massively sized for gates. I forget if it's the foundation or the walls itself, this Garnished with all kinds of gems. And if I go through this life, or any Christian goes through this life, and you know, I'm going to live enough to pay my bills, and I'm going to serve the Lord, I'm not going to tithe, I'm going to give what God has given me, I'm going to give cheerfully to God, and pay my bills. How come when they preach the tithe, they never bring up that widow woman in the, in the gospel? When she put her two mites in, you know what Jesus said? That was all her all. How come the church is, well, you got to give your all and all, the, you know, in the law, the, the, the widow's might, and Jesus acknowledged her. Paul tells the church, give graciously, give wonderfully, give Thankfully, don't give grudgingly. Now I, just, just for the state of the moment to tell you, I'm not bragging, I tithe and above the tithe. And God records everything I give, everything you give. He puts it down in his books. And the more you give to God and Jesus in this world, the more God will give to you in glory. The more you give to yourself in this world, the more you get withdrawals from your from your heavenly account. Enough of giving. Uh, forgive me, I'm still under the weather. The light of the righteous rejoices. That light is Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah. We're, we're happy. Love, joy. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Spirit. My voice. But the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. You know what that means? That's death. Oh, forgive me. I don't know how far it goes back. I forgive me. I don't know how far back in Jewish tradition. But there is a thing where. where Usually the mother, when her children leave the house and go in life, she puts a candle out. Today it's lecture. And when that child dies or becomes a Christian, they turn off or blow out that candle. The child's dies. Candles stay. What I, what I think. I think the candles stay. Well, while that, can that candle's burning in that house, it's get my, my child's still alive. God says, that candle there, if you're wicked, you're out. Don't like death. Only by pride, oh, come in contention. Contention is struggle, contest, quarrel. I was reading, um, uh, all Quiet in the Western Front, a great book to read. And the soldiers, this group of soldiers, buddies, fought many years in the battlefield. And one time they're just, they're at a point, you know, they're not in battle and they're back where they behind the lines. And they're just sitting down one day and they're like, why are we fighting? Why are we killing the French people and the French people trying to kill us? Pride. 
That's what starts the fight. You know when Peter came back with from Cornelius' family, the next chapter says they contended with Peter. Why? We're the Jews. What are you doing with the Gentiles? I'm a world great leader. I deserve more. And the other world great leader, well, I deserve more. And it, you know, it's in the pride. I think about General George Washington, the first president of the United States. Though not president at the time. You know what's been amazing to me with, with President, well, General Washington that became our president? He was a general and he was on a horse and fighting the battle. Napoleon and Alexander were world leaders and they were on their horses fighting battles. Now we had a battle in Iraq and Iran. The Bushes, the Clinton, the Obamas, and the Trumps. I mean, we're in a battle right now. Over, over, we're in war over Iraq right now. Pride, we're going to... How come those men are not out there in the battlefield fighting? There was a time when the world leaders would go out and battle. David, you know what happened when David didn't go to battle like he should? That's when he committed that great sin with Bathsheba. The, I think the Bible says to the back, you have to go look it up. It was a time when kings go off to battle or something like that. Boy, we would have a lot less battles this day and age if we sent the presidents and the ambassadors and the and the prime ministers and the queens and the king, because we sent them into battle too. Boy, we would end the war in Iraq real quick. I got to go out there? Yes, President. <laughs> Get the ambassador over here. We got to end this right away. Our nation is, is being destroyed in Portland, Oregon, and other places right now. And not once. Is any of our political figures there? And now, if they're in the area, the area has been cleaned out by the National Guard and all that. But contention comes by pride. If there is a battle in the church house, somebody's got pride. Somebody won't say, okay. You know what Paul says about that? He says in the letter to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Well, you know, us Smith family. I'm trying to think of a name, you know, that's, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, the Allen family over there, they owed us some money. Happy and McCormick, though it wasn't sure. The Happy and McCormick, they fought and fought and fought and fought. Nobody said, you know what? The generation that have people McCoy, they never said, well, what are we fighting about? So you got the Allens and the Smiths in, in the church back. Paul says, you know what? I forgot. Smiths did who I, I forgot where. Did they do you wrong? Yes, they did. Forget it. Write it off. But you know, that's the pride. Look at Peter. Jesus, how often should my friend, you know, if he offend me? Seventy times. Seven. Peter wanted, uh, I think it was, Jesus said, uh, Peter said seven times, Lord, is that enough? And number eight, I can punch him in the face? And Jesus comes back, no, seven times seventy. I guarantee you Peter's sitting there with his finger. Write it off. You know why you got to be the big cheese? Pride. Again, two weeks ago, the police told me and my lawyer, if you're still here, we're going to arrest you. Pride could have said, go for it. I said, oh, let me, let, let me go in peace. And I'll tell you what, if I can be here, I'll be here. If I'm not supposed to be here, I apologize now. 
Let me go, let the lawyers go do what the lawyering do. And I, I talked to the lawyer today, and he said, and he talked to the city uh, uh, attorney, and he talked to the police department legal fair guy. And if I'm not doing the the office is correct. He talked to in the, both those offices. You know what? I want to say something. I want you to thank that guy for his day. He didn't try to sue it. I want to thank you. I mean, this is my word. What I say. I don't. I want you to thank that guy. Wasn't being a jerk. We reported to the police officer, and the police officer reported. He said, "You know what? I'll go away. If I'm, if I can be here, I'll be back." And he said, "If I can't be here, I apologize. I'll go somewhere else." And the next week, he went to where we told him to go until he got word that, "Hey, pride! If I were going in there and pride, oh, I got the Constitution. I'm America, and oh!" I would have been a jerk. The name of Jesus Christ would have been a jerk. And people may not listen. There may be people tomorrow, tomorrow, hopefully, Lord willing, in the farmer's market, no rain. There may be people at the farmer's market tomorrow saying, you know what? That guy was respectful. I'm going to listen to him. And you may get somebody in that farmer's market, hey, I hate that guy. That guy's so tough. Man, you got a bad disposition about it. Well, what is it? What is it that you, that guy, he, he, he's, a, he's behaved himself. That guy's got pride. I'm proud of being a sinner. But with the well advised is wisdom. The well advised is what? Opposite to pride. Contention is opposite of wisdom. Are you wise? Oh, yes. Have you got pride? Yeah. Then you ain't got wisdom. Well, I'm doctor. I'm DD. I'm. And if you got pride, you ain't got wisdom. And you're not well advised, so you'd be somebody I don't have to go to for counsel. You don't have enough wisdom for counsel. That's a kick in the teeth. Wealth, uh oh, talking about wealth again. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. All these people that get involved in the lottery. You know, they say that there are these people, they win these lotteries. And the people that win the lottery, they do. Hundreds of thousands. Millions, maybe billions of dollars. From the most cases I have heard, I don't know them personally, but the things I have read, the things that I have seen, they buy a dollar ticket and they get a million dollars. You know what happens to most of those people? They end up bankrupt. Even they're going to give the church their 10%. They end up bankrupt. Because the Bible says, if you're going to be getting money vanity, paying a dollar scratch-off ticket to get a million dollars, you didn't labor. The heart, oh, yeah, you scrapped off the silver, whatever they call that coding. Oh, the computer printed out seven numbers, and you sat there. Yeah. 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 The Bible says, no! And then read that, match that verse uh, with uh, verse 7. All right, opposite. But he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Christian, you pay the lottery? The Bible says you're not the, that's Old Testament. You can apply that to today. Paul still said we're not supposed to covet, we're not supposed to lust, Romans chapter 7. And if you're buying the lottery, you're coveting, you're lusting the big jackpot. Oh! No! Well, I got my money from inheritance. That's in the Bible too.
He that gathers by labor, labor opposite of vanity, shall increase compared to the diminishing. Diminish means you lose it. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Now read back to chapter 12, verse 25. Heaviness in the heart of man makes it stoop, unhealthy heart. But a good word maketh it glad. Man, you got good news. But the good news never came. Your heart is sick. You get involved in a religion. My, my religion, I'm not going to hell. I'm going to go to a, a resting place for a little while, but then I'll go to get to before in heaven. I'm going to get to heaven. And you die, and in hell you lift up your eyes. Your heart is going to be heartbroken. You're going to be in hell. How did I get here? Oh, this has got to be purgatory. No, it ain't purgatory. But, I, but, but my, 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 my priest said there's a purgatory. There was a purgatory over there at one time called Abraham's bosom. That's emptied out. When you get a hope and it doesn't happen, it, 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 the Bible says it's a heart sickening. But when the desire cometh, it's a tree of life. Now, it's not that tree of life in the Garden of Eden. But that tree of life brought you life. It, yeah, I'm alive. Listen, uh, I am looking forward to God bringing me another wife. And the day that God brings me another wife, that's going to be life. Glory, hallelujah. Every day, nothing happens. My heart, God, help. Wait to the day when you see Jesus Christ, whether you be absent from the body and present with the Lord, or the day we're... Imagine that moment when we're raptured out of here. Woohoo! I always thought, I'm afraid of height. I get up in the clouds, look down, whoa, wait a minute, no, no more afraid of height. That's gone. God told us the blessed hope is Jesus Christ. And we'll end with verse 13. I thought this would be a great verse to end. Whoso. Male, female, whatever race, whoever you are, whoso despise it the word shall be destroyed but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded all right let's put it to church eight believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be ah that's a bunch of baloney. That's out of a bunch of men wrote the Bible. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But Lord, didn't I? But Lord, didn't I? But Lord, look at what I. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That's why it's important to preach the word. Preach the gospel, not the nonsense, not the junk. Well, he didn't come to watch our movie night. It's not the word. And if he didn't come to your movie night to get the gospel somehow by lying, remember we were read up here by lying. That's not credited to you for their salvation. Well, we got the greatest actor to play Jesus. You got a sinful man to play Jesus who was who was sinless and God. You can't see the lie. They keep posting the, the things about the, the passion of Jesus. Man, 
Baptist wake up, that movie was Catholic, that movie centered around Mary, and they had the Mass every day by Mel Gibson, and the priests were called in on the filming of, I forgot the name of the movie, I don't care about the name of the movie. And the guy who walked around Jesus Christ was not Jesus Christ. He lied to you. The guy who walked around saying he was Peter was not Peter. He lied to you. The one that walked around and said she was Mary is not Mary. She lied to you. The guy who said he was Pilate it was not Pilate. He lied to you. I guarantee, I guarantee, I guarantee it did not come out of the King James Bible. Then they lied to you. Shall we go back to verse 5 or just keep? When you tell them the Bible says and quote what the Bible says and they despise it, they're not despising you, they're despising Jesus and the Bible. And if they don't ever repent and they die despising the word, they will be destroyed. That's why I'm so often telling the people on the street where I preach, I am leaving you without excuse. You cannot tell God. I am so sure what I preach on the street is what the Bible wants me to preach. Is I tell them, I am sure you can never tell God you never knew. Because I am telling you. But, opposite, he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Oh, boy, there goes my voice again. Well, see, the commandment, that's, that's Old Testament. Uh, I'm not going to quote the Bible completely again, so forgive me, please. But a new commandment I give to you that you love others, that you love yourself, or love your enemies. John gave us commandments that you're not to hate your brother, you're to love your brother. Isn't that not command? It's not. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. After the resurrection, the glorified body of Jesus Christ, before he goes up to the right hand of God, he told us something. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. I think that's a commandment. I think Paul said, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. ceasing. I mean, he gave us a whole bunch of, of commandments. I, I forget, first and second, that's the only the last chapter. It's there. That's a list of commandments. Paul gives us a list of commandments. Children, honor your parents, for this is the first commandment from it. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, be susceptible to your husband. There's all kinds of commandments in the church. There's written to Christians, you're not to eat that which is blood, strangled. You're to avoid fornication. And you're to refrain from idol. There are commandments given to Christians on this side of Calvary. Now they may not be the commandments that Psalm is writing to his son. But there are commandments Solomon has under law that, I mean, the Bible says, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's all his good. I mean, we don't honor the Sabbath, but good give your body one day a rest. Thou shalt not take the Lord name, Lord's name in vain. And we throw some other ones in there, you know. Uh, what a woman wears to what a man, uh, you know, a woman's not to wear what pertains to a man, a man not to wear what pertains to a woman, and David cut the skirt off of Saul. And then women wear skirts going to church. Problem. When Jesus said to the twelve disciples, I'm going to commission you, you're going to go out, you're going to, you're going to heal the sick, you're, you're going to drive the, the devils out, you're going to raise the dead. Oh, by the way, don't bring your purses. And he was talking to the men, not their wives. How many men in church have a purse? And you got to rightly divide the word. I mean, it's great. I mean, do not print marks. For the dead. I mean, they say tattoo. That's for the dead. But if you look at a lot of tattoos, I mean, there are skulls and, and, and a reference of dead. 
There are great commandments in the, in, the, in the law that we ought to follow, not for salvation, to be a good person before God in the world and the church. But there are commandments to Christians. 